I get asked about my name every single day. I started flying when I was 21 years old because I would get asked if I was a pilot. I finally just went for it. As a little girl, I spent a lot of time researching Amelia. And the more I learned about her, the more fascinated I became in how bold she was. Recreating the flight around the world after Amelia's flight in 1937 was all about closing her flight plan for her as her namesake. When you think about looking at a world map or looking at a globe and imagining yourself literally circling the globe in a tiny little airplane with only one engine, it's hard to believe that it actually happened. For me, the hardest part about longer flights, sometimes seven to 10 hours long, is the mental and physical fatigue that you go through. You're concentrating in extreme ways for those types of flights, especially when you're crossing over oceans. When I'm flying the plane and I'm wearing the A20, it's almost as if I don't even have it on. It's completely comfortable, and I've heard my most important and most memorable aspects of my flight through that headset. It almost just becomes a part of me. I fly because it's the biggest sense of adventure I could ever ask for. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to episode five of the Virtual Flight School. Once again, a big thank you to uh, Bose and to Pratt & Whitney for partnering us in this event. And um, we hope that you're going to enjoy this evening's presentation. We have a lot to cover. Tonight, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, uh, the flight with an aft center of gravity, about fly-by-wire, a couple of other aerodynamic things uh, that, uh, that, that are of interest, and, uh, and then uh, hopefully we'll have time to discuss a little bit about twin-engine operations and then aerobatics. Uh, so we start off with uh, a, a discussion on uh, flight with an aft center of gravity. We know that for any aeroplane in flight, the lift vector is made up of primarily the lift that is generated by the wings, but there is also a contribution from the fuselage that generates lift, and then also lift from the tailplane. So one, two, three things uh, go to make up the total amount of lift that is represented by the aircraft's lift vector. The aeroplane may be loaded with an aft center of gravity or with a forward center of gravity. The setup is that for most long distance flights, airliners end up dispatching with a forward center of gravity. They need a lot of fuel. If they need a lot of fuel, it means that that center tank, we talk about the center tank, it is located in the bowels of the aircraft, but can you see almost uh, here where the leading edge of the wing is, leading to a forward center of gravity. If the airplane is full of passengers and they have a lot of baggage, there is an aft baggage compartment and a forward baggage compartment. Both of them are full. There's a lot of weight up front over here. So the bottom line is that most aeroplanes that dispatch on a long distance flight uh, have uh, forward center of gravities. The moment you have a forward center of gravity, the the two things. Number one, the aeroplane is very stable in pitch. It requires uh, lots of force on the elevator or comparatively more force on the control yoke or the stick to get the aeroplane to pitch upwards or downwards. Aeroplane, as I said, very stable. The setup is that besides being very stable, with the nose being low, uh, and the aeroplane or tending towards being lower, what happens is that you need to apply a force on the tailplane to hold that nose up. And the instant that you do that, you are moving the elevator up. You can see nicely on this aeroplane. And here you see what is an aerofoil that is essentially inverted. The lift is being generated downwards. A downward force exists. 
the value of that, the amount of lift that is being generated in the wrong direction, uh, must be subtracted from the overall lift of the aeroplane. So that means that you have a deficit in, in terms of what you are getting from the wings and the fuselage because the uh, tailplane is working against all the other lift that you have. It must be subtracted from the lift vector. The moment you subtract lift from the lift vector, you've got to make that lift up, so you have to increase the angle of attack. The moment you increase the angle of attack, which of course increases the coefficient of lift, as you do that, so you are going to have more induced drag. The aeroplane is going to tend to slow down. You're going to have to advance the thrust levers, push the throttles forward a little bit more, a little bit, get a little bit of extra uh, power in order to stop the deceleration. And you are going to have uh, an increased fuel burn. It is going to cost you in economy. So uh, let's go over that again. Forward center of gravity, very stable. You need to keep the nose up. Elevator is positioned upwards. Lift acts downwards from the tailplane. That lift is subtracted from the overall lift. You therefore have to increase the angle of attack of the aeroplane or increase the speed. Either way, either way, there will be more drag and you will need more thrust or more power and that is going to cost you. On the other hand, if you were to load the aeroplane with an aft C of G. And this is the preferable way to load all of these airliners. This too, this Boeing 737-800, note where the fuel tank is likely to be. It's likely to be over here somewhere, giving you a forward center of gravity. This aeroplane also has an aft uh, uh, baggage compartment and a forward one, but you're flying short range, people aren't taking as much baggage with them. The preferable place to put the baggage is in the aft cargo compartment, which tends towards causing an aft center of gravity to exist. And the other thing is to load the passengers as far back as you possibly can. And by so doing, you will dispatch with the aeroplane having a slight aft center of gravity. The moment you have an aft center of gravity, the nose is tending to pitch upwards. You are pushing forward on the stick to keep the nose in that position. That's where you want it and that's where you're going to trim it. Those elevators are coming down, down. Note that you have an aerofoil section over here. Beautiful curvature over here. You are going to get increased lift from the tailplane. That lift is going to contribute to what you already have from the fuselage and from the wings. And by so doing, because you have this extra amount of lift as a result of what's happening back here, you are able to fly the aeroplane with a slightly lower angle of attack. You're able to fly with a lower angle of attack and uh, there's going to be less induced drag and you aren't going to need as much thrust and you are going to be able to operate that aeroplane more economically. And what did I say? I said that all of the dispatchers at airports all over the world that are doing the, 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 the loading and the load sheets for these airliners, they concentrate on trying to get the center of gravity as far off as they possibly can. What is the downside? The downside is that with an off center of gravity comes 
uh, more instability. It is more difficult to keep that aeroplane level. And when you're maneuvering, you can feel a slight instability in the handling of the aeroplane. That's why when you're flying your advanced single engine aeroplanes and your light twins aeroplane, you're always very, very conscious of rather of rather having the weight forward instead of aft because with an aft center of gravity comes a certain amount of instability. So, flight with an aft center of gravity, certainly more economical, but more challenging because of the instability. So what has come up in recent times? What has developed in recent times? Uh, and when I say recent, I'm talking perhaps 25, 30 years. That was the advent of fly-by-wire, FBW, fly-by-wire. Who were the prime movers and shakers in this change from conventionally operated controls? Uh, I would say that was Airbus Industries. And uh, the test bed was the A300, and then they got serious with the A320 series, the A310, A320s, the A330s, the A340s, the A380s. They all fly by wire aeroplanes. So, what does fly by wire mean? It means that there are computers that are sending signals to electromechanical actuators that are built into the aeroplane for the elevators, rudders, ailerons, flaps, and also for braking. Braking on the ground. Good old-fashioned hydraulic braking on the ground as well is also computerized. They've got these electromechanical actuators. Computers send signals down thin wires right across the aeroplane to wherever you need an actuator. And the manufacturers have been able to dispense with all the cabling, if you had cables, or push rods, or belt cranks, or whatever it was that you needed in terms of hardware. And all the little levers and things that you needed, together with bushing and nuts and bolts, and whatever went into building this control system for the rudder, the elevators, the ailerons, and I said certain other components of the aeroplane, all of that cost a lot of money, weighed a lot, and was very complex and was maintenance intensive. So with fly-by-wire, instead you have certain computers, primary flight control computers, secondary flight control computers, uh, uh, brake control computers, all sorts of computers that are sending, measuring, sensing rates of acceleration and movement, etc., 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 and sending signals down towards these controls, therefore saving a lot of weight and complexity. The moment you save weight, the aeroplane becomes more economical to operate. That is one of the very, very first advantages of fly-by-wire. The second advantage is that it can build restrictions into the limits to which you can maneuver this aeroplane. And so, for example, they impose on the aeroplane a maximum bank angle ever of 67 degrees. The aeroplane cannot be banked beyond that uh, bank angle. They have side sticks. If you hold that side stick right over, the aeroplane will roll until 67 degrees and that's where it will stop. You simply cannot roll it any further. If you had to let go of the stick in that instant, then the aeroplane would automatically reduce its angle of bank until it got to 33 degrees. At 30 degree, 33 degrees, that's where it would stay. So you, you uh, apply more bank, you go to say 55, 60 degrees of bank, you let go of the stick, boom, 
comes back to 33 degrees. It gets even cleverer than that. And if you happen to be in an overspeed situation, you are uh, uh, at, at the red line, what they call VMO, Velocity of Maximum Operation, or MMO, the Mach number for max operation, and you are at a very high speed and you have bank on, you let go the stick and immediately it will roll the wings actually absolutely level. The other thing is that the pitch attitude for the Airbus series of airliners, that is 30 degrees pitch up. You can never ever pitch the aeroplane up beyond 30 degrees. And in the dive, the maximum dive angle is 15 degrees. So that offers you a lot of additional safety. And also the computer software also ensures to it in certain regimes the aeroplane cannot be stalled because signals intervene to in fact take you away from uh, angles of attack where stalling could occur. So that is the second advantage, big advantage. Uh, the third advantage is that because there are so many zillions of signals that are coming out of these computers to the uh, actuators in every single second, uh, the data is pouring in towards these actuators, enabling the pilot to very easily control the aeroplane. So you are able to cope with an aft center of gravity and the instability that occurs with an aft center of gravity that much easier through fly-by-wire control than through ordinary old-fashioned control that exists. So it makes it much easier to fly with this aft center of gravity and by so doing you are picking up a lot more in terms of economy. So that's what fly-by-wire does for you. Fly-by-wire is not restricted to the Airbus family of airliners. It is spreading in amongst all other manufacturers as well, and it is uh, very much alive and well in the manufacture and the operation of uh, jet fighters, because there you're able to optimize or maximize the amount of maneuverability that might be required in the various operations where conflict occurs. So uh, um, fly-by-wire is just a wonderful thing to work with and long may it continue and long may it develop even further. Throughout the course we have been talking about aerodynamics over and over and over again, certain aerodynamic principles surface. But here and there, there are certain things that happen that are really of interest. And uh, I thought that it would be a nice thing this evening just to talk about certain other aspects that are of interest in the subject of aerodynamics. And um, the first one that I think we'll kick off with is uh, what they call control reversal. Control reversal was a big, big thing when I was a little kid and we were still watching black and white movies. And uh, there was a movie called Sound Barrier that I went to go and see when I was about eight years old. And there's a very, very dramatic scene over there where the controls reverse and uh, and, and, and the film star, the guy that was flying the aeroplane, sends out a mayday and he screams and shouts and he says that the controls have reversed and, uh, and where they picked it up, I don't know. I don't know where they picked this up from, but it certainly was very dramatic. Funny thing is that there was a certain amount of truth to the phenomena of control reversal. So let's just talk uh, a little bit about control reversal. And I think what we'll do is we'll start off with the Harvard because 
of all the aeroplanes I have flown, the only one I've, I can remember ever reading anything about maximum aileron application was for the Harvard. And they, in the handbook, it says that you may not exceed a speed of 156 knots. 156 knots is the maximum that you can apply full aileron in any direction. And this has to do with control reversal. Because what is happening over here is that if you look at this wing there, you see that with the aileron up, at 156 knots, there is a considerable force on that aileron. And not only is it causing the wing to roll in that direction, the wingtip in the direction of the undercarriage like that, but it is causing a torsional twist in the wing. So as this goes up, and the trailing edge here takes all the airflow load. So this part of the wing here, this surface area, immediately in front of the aileron, but it spreads up the rest of the wing. That bends in the opposite direction, up like that. That bends up there. Remember the lift formula said uh, lift equals CL half rho v squared s, look at the surface area there compared to the surface area of that aileron. Which one is eventually going to win? This one over here, that surface area there. And what is going to happen is that it will generate more lift on this wing, and instead of the wing going down, the wing will want to come up. We want to come up like that. In the opposite direction, there is a reversal. Here, We've talk, we talked about that aileron going up. We're talking about this aileron here on the opposite side going down. As this goes down here, the aileron, there's an immense force down here where the hinge line is, pushes the trailing edge of the main wing up. There's a torsional twist with the leading edge going down. The, the, there is a lot of uh, lift being generated on the bottom side. And instead of the wing coming up, the wing wants to go down like that. I think it's a little bit easier if I take this and imagine that what I just concocted out of a Woolworths packet is that if this here, this portion of the wing is represented by that part of the packet, the aileron itself is here. As this aileron went down at 156 knots plus, so it pushed the trailing edge of the wing up, there was the major portion of the lift that is being generated, boom. And instead of this wing going up, the wing started going down because of this torsional twist. Have I ever encountered this? Never. Never. I just, limits are there to be obeyed. You never exceed any limit that is published. So I've done all my rolling in Harvard's around about 140 knots, and I haven't had a problem. At 156 knots plus, you are going to, it might not reverse. It might not reverse. But what it'll do is it will slow that roll rate right down because of the twist in the wing. My father was a wartime pilot, and he, knowing how keen I was about flying in later years, always said to me that I should not be influenced by crew room stories, the incredible stories that would be forthcoming from pilots' peer group, in which you would swear that the fellow was Chuck Yeager or Bob Hoover. With, with stories that came out of their mouths. He'd listened to some talk about guys uh, diving um, the airspeed Oxford to well over the red line whilst practicing uh, 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 bombing. And he listened with half an ear and eventually he was influenced by the story and he went out and he got into this 
um, airspeed Oxford, which was a wooden aeroplane. Uh, and we're talking about 1939 over here. And he put the aeroplane into an incredible dive. Tells the story, told me the story over and over again. And eventually he went through the red line. And at that stage, he'd satisfied himself that he could fly as fast as any one of his pals. And he started pulling out of the dive. And as he started pulling out of the dive, he had what was tantamount to a control reversal. So what happened was he was pulling back on the stick. The elevator was coming up. There was a huge amount of pressure on the hinge line over there, which was pushing the trailing edge of the stabilizer down. That was bending the stabilizer and the force was being generated upwards like that. Instead of a force being generated downwards so that the aeroplane would pull out, it was being generated upwards, which was keeping the nose down. So I said it, that doesn't necessarily uh, reverse. The, the worse it gets, the faster you go, the more force you put on the, the, uh, uh, the outboard section of the wing if you are rolling, or on the tailplane if you are pitching, then the more the effect is going to be felt. and You might in fact get a total reversal. But all that he had was about a 75 to 80 percent degradation in the ability for the aeroplane to pitch. And he pulled and pulled and pulled. He said that he actually thought his day had come. And when he finally pulled out of this thing, he got back. This was in Zimbabwe at a place called Guello. He landed there and uh, they pulled the uh, uh, grass out of the air coolers and oil coolers for the engine because of this reduced uh, uh, pitching rate. So, the bottom line, once again, is if there's a limitation that has been put into the flight operations manual, live and die by that. Okay, actually don't die. Just live by that limitation. Live by that limitation. Uh, and, and you won't get into this sort of trouble. We were saying that we're looking at a couple of interesting aerodynamic things. And in in my time, I have heard some incredible stories about uh, the, the very high-powered, single-engined piston fighters uh, of World War II, when single-engine fighters had uh, reached the zenith of their capability. I'm talking about aeroplanes such as the Thunderbolt and uh, Spitfire, the Hurricane, Mustang, etc, etc, etc. And I always heard this story that any time you ever went from idle to full power or you took power very, very rapidly, then the aeroplane would roll onto its back and that was the end of it all. You wouldn't be able to control the aeroplane. Now, in my time, I have been very, very lucky as a civilian to be able to fly uh, four different uh, World War II fighters. I've flown the, uh, the Spitfire, I've flown the Mustang, I've flown the Russian Yak-3, and I've flown the Sea Fury, which only saw service right at the end of the war. But nevertheless, they're all high-powered piston-engined aeroplanes. And in all four of those aeroplanes, I took the trouble to slow right down to, to just a, a, about gliding speed or so with very little power, and I opened up from there to full power. Now, when I'm saying full power, I'm not talking 30 inches of, of uh, manifold pressure. I am talking about engines that were supercharged and that could push out two atmospheres of pressure into the engine. And you could get between 54 and 60 inches of manifold pressure. Uh, from from these aeroplanes as you opened up. And what I've found 
that was that not one single one of those airplanes wanted to roll onto its back. Now I'll tell you why. Because if you go back to one of the early lessons, you will remember we talked about slipstream effect. There was that spiral or helical flow of air around the fuselage which would strike the fin and would cause the aeroplane to yaw significantly. That slipstream effect was most felt or most profound at low speeds. The higher the speed, the more the, the helix tended to stretch out and extend to further behind the aeroplane. But, but at low speeds, and this is where this chatter came from, that if at low speed you opened up, the aeroplane would roll onto its back. I never found that happen once. What I did find is that if you flew the aeroplane the way you were taught to fly aeroplanes in lesson two or lesson three or lesson four, and that is that as the power increased with a piston-engined aeroplane, so the slipstream effect, the helical slipstream effect, came into being, that caused the aeroplane to yaw. If the aeroplane yaws and the yaw is not counteracted or checked, then what is going to happen is the further effect of this yaw is going to be, the aeroplane is going to start banking and go into a spiral dive. And this is what was 10 to 1 happening so many years ago, that with application of the power, the pilot was neglecting to counteract the slipstream effect and the yaw that was caused and therefore secondary effect of yaw was to cause a roll and a spiral dive. And I found that all of those aeroplanes were actually pussycats in this respect. No problem whatsoever provided, provided you remembered what we discussed in lesson two or lesson three over here, and that was that you counteracted any tendency for the aeroplane to yaw. So we've talked a lot about aerodynamics up until now. Please remember that I will be available to answer questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. We continue with a little, little bit more aerodynamical talk and let's see how uh, certain principles apply to the operation of light twin-engined aircraft. The light twin-engined aircraft I'm talking about here are aeroplanes such as the Beach Travel Air and the Beach Baron, the Piper Seneca and the Aztec, the, the uh, Apache and the Navajo, the Cessna 310 and the uh, other 300 and 400 series aircraft. They are light twin-engined aeroplanes. They are super aircraft to fly. They're lovely efficient aeroplanes to fly. They're also safe to fly because engine failures are few and far between. Very few and far between. So what, why is it that engines do fail from time to time in these light twin-engined aircraft? It is usually because of mismanagement. I, I hate the word pilot error, but call it uh, 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 mismanagement in respect of the fact that you now have with these aeroplanes a, a fairly complex uh, a fuel switching system and if a mistake has been made over there and a tank runs dry, then an engine is in all likelihood going to, uh, to fail. As I said, the uh, Failures occur as a result of mismanagement from the pilot with these airplanes rather than failures of the engine. They are reliable pieces of machinery. Now what happens is that if one should find that you are uh, flying on one engine, one of the engines has failed and you have had to shut it down entirely, you're on one engine, 
and you are not making headway. You're at uh, you're over the inland plateau of South Africa where the average height is five and a half thousand feet above sea level. It's a stinking hot summer's day. You're loaded up with people and, and, and baggage, etc., etc., etc. And the aeroplane is not performing that well. You need to climb and uh, because they're obstacles and so you go to full power on the live engine whereas the, the, the engine that has failed will get to what you're going to do about that engine. But the thing is that the moment, the moment you are flying that aeroplane and there is a difference in power output between these two engines that you see over here this represents the vertical axis of the aeroplane. The aeroplane is going to yaw. If this is the engine that is turning and this is the one that has failed, the aeroplane is going to yaw in the direction of the dead engine around the vertical axis of the aeroplane. That is what is going to happen. So now, the severity of that yaw depends on the power output of this engine, the live engine. The more power that is being put out by this engine here, the more the tendency will be for the aeroplane to yaw. It also depends on the condition of the failed engine. Might not be fully failed. It might be putting out partial power. It might be giving you zero power. All right. And if, if it was in fact giving you partial power, the severity of the yaw would not be as intense. It also depends on whether this propeller is windmilling, it's being driven by the air, in which case it produces a horrendous amount of drag, or it might have been feathered where the blades are lying in line, absolutely in line with the airflow where the drag will be the least. So if you have maximum power here and maximum drag over there, the severity of the yaw is intense. As your performance degrades, or if it was degraded from the word go because of where you were, how heavy you were, how hot it was outside, etc., 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 you would raise the nose to try and climb and, uh, and to try and get some, some space between yourself and the ground and uh, get some altitude for safety's sake, etc., etc. But the speed would start decaying. As the speed decays and you lose more and more speed, you need more and more of a rudder input over here. All right to ensure that the aeroplane is going to be kept straight. And as, as the speed reduces more and more and more, because, because you, 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 you are flying yourself into a corner and you have no option, then you find that you need more and more and more and more rudder. Eventually you will get to a point where you have used all your rudder, you're using a little bit of aileron in the direction of the failed engine, but we won't debate that, all right? We're just saying that you've got this, this uh, uh, huge yawing moment. You're using more and more and more and more rudder to keep the aeroplane straight, and eventually you will run out of rudder. At the point where you run out of rudder and you can no longer keep the aeroplane straight by using the ailerons as well, then what happens is that the aeroplane starts yawing. As it yaws, so the further effect of yaw is to cause roll and eventually the aeroplane goes into a spiral dive. That whole process began when you reached a speed called the VMC the minimum control speed. And at that speed, you effectively or essentially have lost control of the aeroplane. Now, that 
speed is indicated on uh, certain categories of aeroplanes by means of a red line. If you are on one engine, you never ever let the speed decay to the point that it reaches the red line because that's when you will lose control. Now, that speed is not the one constant speed at which the aeroplane will always lose control at. There are an infinite number of VMC speeds depending on the power output of the engine, whether the dead engine is in fact giving you partial power or zero power, or whether it is windmilling or whether it is feathered, or what the 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 ambient conditions are like outside of the aeroplane affecting the power output of what happens to be the live engine. So the VMC is infinitely variable, but the VMC that is published in the handbook is for a worst case scenario. So let's have a look and see how, when the aeroplane goes through certification, what is taken to, uh, into account in determining the minimum control speed. The first and foremost is a standard day at sea level is assumed. Temperature 15 degrees C, pressure 1013 uh, hectopascals and the density of air, whatever it's supposed to be at sea level on a standard day. So the power output of the live engine, I keep on using this engine, anyway, it doesn't matter for the time being. That is number one, that that engine must be at take off power, maximum power. The, the dead engine must be windmilling, not feathered. That gives, you the, that gives you the greatest yawing couple. Then the next thing is that the aeroplane must be uh, loaded at its aft center of gravity. So here we have uh, the aeroplane with a forward center of gravity, and this is where the vertical axis of the aeroplane is. The aeroplane is yawing around that point. You put in, uh, the, you, you, you move the center of gravity onto its aft limit, and that is where the center of gravity is now, behind where it was before, and the aeroplane is yawing around that point there and the moment arm between the vertical axis and the fin is the least and therefore the effect of that rudder is less than it would be if the center of gravity was way up front and you had a greater moment arm. Now the other thing is that they are taking into account, I have been using this as the engine that is running all the time throughout this discussion. This has been the engine that's turning, this has been the culprit, this has been the engine that, uh, that has been failed. But the thing is, if an engine's going to fail, that's the one you want to fail, not that one. This is the critical engine. It is critical for a certain reason. And that is, if you cast your mind back to lesson two or lesson three, we talked about asymmetric blade effect. Now, what that meant was that not when the aeroplane was level. When the aeroplane is level, the angle that this blade cuts the air, so you're standing here, you're looking this way, and you can see that the leading edge of that blade is ahead of the trailing edge of the same blade, and there, there is your angle of attack. And the thrust that is produced by the blade depends on the angle of attack, but the, the blade coming up on the back side over here is at the same angle. That angle, up going propeller, same angle as the down going propeller. Up going propeller, same angle as the down going propeller, all four of them. The moment you put the aeroplane in that attitude, like that, a climb attitude, the moment you do that, this blade, is meeting the air at a greater angle of attack 
the speed of the blade has not reduced. So the thrust being developed by that downward going blade is more than the thrust of the up going blade because this blade is cutting the airflow at a far lower angle. That we said was asymmetric blade effect. So here, this is the down going propeller developing the most thrust compared to the up going. Same on this side, this side as well, the down going blade, greater thrust than the up going blade. But have a look at the moment arm here, the moment arm between, between the vertical axis of the aeroplane and where this blade is. You've got a big moment arm which causes a lot of yawing. The yaw has a greater moment arm and the aeroplane wants to yaw more than if this was the operating engine with the moment arm between the down going blade here and the center of gravity or where the vertical axis of the aeroplane is, is far less. So it is, it is better if an engine is going to fail that it is this engine. This engine, if it is running and that one if it's dead gives you a far higher yawing moment which will give you a higher minimum control speed. So one of the other ways that the aeroplane is certified is that they fill it up to its maximum weight, its maximum weight. For any speed that we have, the higher the weight, the higher the angle of attack of the aeroplane. And so the higher the attitude of the aeroplane and therefore the angle of attack, the higher the P factor is. So this is the critical engine, and that is the uh, engine that they have failed when they're doing the certification. They come out with the, the highest possible VMC speed. That is the speed that is marked with a red line, and that is the speed you should never ever approach in twin engine operations when you happen to be flying on one engine. So uh, the reason I've covered this is that uh, in the days when I sat on selection boards in South African Airways for pilots and I asked for an explanation on this, uh, the, the answers were mostly incorrect. There were very few guys that actually got this spot on and were able to explain to you what the factors were uh, affecting the VMC of an aeroplane. So I thought it was important uh, that you should know these. I just want to remind you that at the end of the session um, I will be available for uh, questions. Any questions that you might wish to pose. I'm going to end off uh, this evening with a short talk on aerobatics. Our uh, very special guest is going to be Ellis Levine talking on the subject of formation aerobatics. Uh, uh, he is arguably one of the most experienced uh, formation aerobatic pilots in the entire country and he's going to have a lot to say that I'm sure we'll find it very interesting but uh, just uh, just to whet your appetites or to uh, or to give you more insight into the subject of aerobatics let me say that uh, that I firmly believe that uh, all pilots should at some stage of their lives learn something more about their aeroplanes by doing a course in aerobatics. If you happen to get hooked on aerobatics, it's going to cost you a lot of money, but you're going to have a lot of fun. It really is a fantastic discipline. Where do you learn to fly aerobatics? You're lucky if you were in the military, that's where you would have learned. Otherwise, what you've got to do is you've either got to go and find a flying school where they have uh, an aerobatic curriculum and there aren't many of those around, or you've got to find yourself a mentor, somebody that, uh, that has got a lot of aerobatic experience and that has uh, taught aerobatics and to have that fellow 
take you under his or her wing and teach you the art of aerobatics and teach you properly. I emphasize that you must be taught properly. You have to be very careful about who it is that is going to teach you. You don't want a show off, a guy that is going to try and impress you with what he can or cannot do, or somebody that is learning all the time at your expense, while, while actually telling you that he is teaching you, he himself is still in a situation where he is learning himself. So you find yourself a good, well-known uh, a mentor that comes highly recommended or you go to a flight school and then after that the way to go is actually to participate in the sport of competition aerobatics. Every other top class aerobatic pilot display pilot, every aerobatic display pilot in the world uh, or uh, people that have really amounted to something in the display arena are guys that flew competition to a high level. It taught them the, the discipline, it taught them about energy management, safety, and also the art of putting the display in, in front of where, where all the, the, the people are congregated uh, so as to enjoy an air show. So, a choice of aeroplane is very important and there aren't many aeroplanes out there that you can learn aerobatics in. Of course the first aeroplane that always comes to mind is the Pitt Special. It's a very very capable little aeroplane. It flies beautiful aerobatics and it's going to give you about the best bang for the buck other than the Belenka Super Decathlon. That is a terrific uh, aeroplane to learn aerobatics on and also to do a tail dragger conversion on. So you can kill two birds with one stone if you happen to get access to a Belanca Super Decathlon. The other terrific training aeroplane is the Extra 300, but it is a very, very high performance aeroplane and it is an aeroplane that uh, requires a lot of experience to fly nicely and it's also very expensive to operate. To summarize, look for a, a guy that comes highly recommended to teach you in the first place and then look for either a place where you can learn on the Pit Special or the Super Decathlon. There are other aeroplanes that you can fly aerobatics in, but you aren't going to make as much progress in them as you are in the aeroplanes that I have just mentioned. I mean, there are people that came up on tiger moths and chipmunks and are very, very successful aerobatic pilots today, but uh, but um, it, it is the more modern aeroplanes that I mentioned a moment ago that are going to give you more bang for your buck. Uh, what will you end up being taught? And the, and the setup is there's a basic curriculum. I think I mentioned it in one of the other sessions that we did. And I said air forces all over the world, flying schools all over the world, and mentors all over the world teach the same basic uh, uh, aerobatics and from those you can work the variations on a theme. Once you know the basics you can then start expanding on everything. So the, the first place to start with any aerobatic training is always with a spinning module, you're either going to do spinning and somewhat advanced spinning, or you're going to do a refresher on spinning just to make you familiar with the idiosyncrasies and the characteristics of the aeroplane that you're going to be doing your aerobatic training in. Once you have done a fair amount of spin training or spin refreshment, then you go on to the grandfather of all maneuvers and that is the loop. You start off in straight and level over here, having gained a lot of speed of course, and you loop, that is the loop. The next maneuver would tend to one be 
the straight roll. And what happens there is that you roll around the longitudinal axis of the aeroplane. A lot of these aeroplanes might not have fuel injection and you might have carburetors. You need to keep a certain amount of positive G, certainly the case in the Harvard. And what happens there is you pull the aeroplane up slightly you roll it, but you're letting the nose drop. So there, there's a little bit of positive G. See that? And then you're finishing the roll there. You've rolled 180 degrees around the longitudinal axis, and you have learned to do the straight roll. Okay, at a later stage, you will learn to do that straight roll right around a point. You'll be able to do it like this. But here you're pushing negative G, and you need a fuel-injected engine to accomplish that, or you need to throttle back if you're in a carbureted engined aeroplane. And that's how you roll like that. Then the next, the next maneuver would tend to one be a barrel roll. And what are you doing in a barrel roll? You're actually flying, uh, if, if, if you had to take a cylinder, put it parallel to the aeroplane like this, or a Coke bottle or, or a, uh, any long pipe, with a wide diameter, and you are flying the aeroplane around that tube. That is the barrel roll. So we've done three maneuvers now. We've done the loop, we've done straight rolls, we've done barrel rolls. You would learn to fly the stall turn, where the aeroplane, having achieved enough speed in the dive, is pulled up to the vertical, the vertical is held, it continues to fly up vertically, right? And then it is yawed around the vertical axis of the aeroplane, and down it comes. That is the stall turn. Very interesting maneuver because of all the aerodynamic effects that are involved. The slipstream effect is highlighted. The further effect of yaw is highlighted. Gyroscopics are highlighted. Coincidentally, where fellows have lost control of the aeroplane and had narrow escapes or actually flown into the ground, right, crashed and passed away. Unfortunately, uh, very unfortunate when something like this happens, but they usually occur off the stall turn. If a stall turn is mismanaged, you could end up in a spinning situation, and that's why we, we refresh on spinning before we even get started. And then, all that there is really left to do in this very, very basic class of aerobatics is to do the Cuban 8, where you, you've dived, you start off from here, by definition, this is where the maneuver actually begins, even though you were diving to get a lot of speed. And you pull it over like this, and when you're almost three quarters of the way, you stop on a 45 degree inverted down line, and before that engine can cut out, if it's carburetted, poops, you roll it this way. All right, it's a half figure of eight called commonly a half cubinate. Boom, and this is the other half Cuban 8. They go one to the left, one to the right, so that you don't become handed, and so that you learn how to do rolls both left and right. And with that, you have more or less covered the aerobatic curriculum. There is what they call a reverse Cuban 8, where you pull up to 45 degrees, body attitude, boop, you half roll, and then you pull through the bottom side of the loop. Once you have done those, you are ready to go out on your own and to explore the great world of aerobatics. And you can do one of two things. If you are well connected and you can spend the time and the money on training, you can go back to this flight school and then you could get involved in an, an, in an outfit that has what they call an aerial operating certificate. That's the sort of operation that I fly for, where we perform aerobatics commercially. 
And where other people are, are doing charters or airline flying or pipeline inspections or uh, uh, casualty evacuations or whatever, and they're licensed to do that, we are licensed to do uh, aerobatics for hire and for reward. You could get involved with such an outfit and then you could progress along a route that will eventually have you flying displays commercially. The alternative is to get involved in competition aerobatics and, uh, 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 as I said, a fascinating sport, and to fly competition aerobatics and see what materializes from there onwards. So uh, I can only encourage you to learn to fly aerobatics if you possibly can. It's also good for uh, uh, unusual attitude recoveries, learning how to recover from any attitude that you might be in. And a little while later, you're going to be listening to Ellis as he talks to you on the doubly fascinating subject of uh, formation aerobatics. Our uh, very special guest this evening is Ellis Levine, who needs very little introduction. He's, uh, he's been flying formation aerobatics, arguably almost more than any other pilot in the country. Uh, a very experienced formation aerobatic pilot. And uh, Ellis, how long have you actually been flying now? I've been flying for 31 years. I started flying when I was 16, so it's 31 years now. And, and uh, of that time, how much of how much of that time have you spent flying formation aerobatics? I've spent 28 years flying formation aerobatics. Obviously, the first couple of years I was just filling in for you guys, not for you in particular, but for the Chubb aerobatic team. So I started, I did my first show when I was 19. I filled in for someone, I can't remember who it was. It was either uh, Chris Roderman or Laurie or Johannes at the time. And then uh, you trained me up. Chris, Jeff, Laurie and Johan all had their bit of training to do while they were involved in my training. And uh, I started filling in for them when they weren't available. And uh, as team members left, uh, like Chris left for overseas, Laurie also left, Johan stayed, Jeff unfortunately passed away, I started flying more and more and eventually I became a, uh, a, a solid member of the team, not just a, a reserve. And, and Ellis, in all of that time, I suppose you've seen a lot of the country flying, flying air shows. Yeah, well we've seen We've seen South Africa, we've flown it flat from all corners. Uh, we've yeah, ferried aircraft all over the country. And uh, your, your favorite over border uh, excursions to go and display over border, have you enjoyed those? Yeah, yeah we've had some good, good times, particularly in uh, Matsieng, Botswana. Uh, they've always treated us well and uh, the air show is fun, but uh, after air show events are just as as much fun. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now in in uh, all of these years flying formation aerobatics, uh, I think we've changed aeroplanes here and there. We've flown in different aeroplanes. At one time, we had a team that had uh, 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 two aeroplanes, two highly aerobatic aeroplanes from. Uh, from the United States of America called the Edge 540. So how many different types have you flown in formation aerobatic teams? I've flown four different types. Uh, particularly, we started with the, the Pitzer. So I've done most of my formation aerobatics in, in Pitt specials. Uh, Harvard, for a time, a spell, we, we operated a two-ship Zlin team, and now we're also operating a two-ship extra team. And I also flew extras with Brad Bennis when he was sponsored by Mazda, also for a, a two, I think it was about a two, three year period. Of all those aeroplanes, um, which would you say is your favorite? It, it's hard to say which is my favorite. I enjoy them all, but they, they definitely have their strengths and weaknesses. And uh, the easiest for me is the pit special. 
I find that it's got good references. It, there's a great balance between maneuverability and stability and performance. It could do with a little bit more performance, uh, but as far as maneuverability and stability is concerned, there's, a, there's a, a really good balance. The Harvard is very stable, but less maneuverable, and it's in need of also a little bit more performance. I mean, truth be told, uh, it's an underpowered aeroplane. And that is probably the most challenging uh, aeroplane to fly in formation, from my perspective. The extras, uh, great performance, very maneuverable, but flying in formation, they are very, very sensitive, requires a higher skill set or a higher skill level, in my opinion. And then the Zlin, Zlin is very much like the Pits too. It's also, if I, have to, if I had to start an aerobatic team again, I would say Zlin 50s, well, Pit Specials, first of all, with a little bit more performance. Uh, the references in the Pit Special are fantastic. What do you mean by, by this word references? Could you just explain uh, to, to our uh, participants what, uh, uh, what you mean by references? So basically, in order for a wingman to keep his station, he has to find references on the Leeds aircraft. And on something like a Harvard, they're not as obvious as they would be on something like a Pitt Special. And you fly in relation to those references. Those references tell you whether you're too far forward, too far back, too far out, too far in, too far up, and too far down. And uh, a Pitts just provides you with good references. Because of the biplane, the flying wires, the landing wires, it's difficult to explain without showing you on an aeroplane, but it just does provide you with the best. So if you were, if you were formating on this Harvard, for example, and uh, I was leading, and uh, you fly in the customary position of number three, which is on my left wing. What do you use as references to ensure that you don't move around out of, out of position? So I would take my, uh, for fore and after, I'd take my nav light and I would send it straight down the hinge line of the, the elevator. That would be my fore after uh, position. The, uh, up down position, I try and see that there's the same amount of uh, elevator or empennage uh, horizontal stabilizer. This, I, I look to see that there's the same amount on the top as the bottom. And then the in out is the difficult one on a monoplane. Uh, guys have come up with various references over the time. I've never really been able to see them. And just over time, with the Harvards, that is, I think Arnie and myself have just found a natural position by. By gauging it. So you say you struggle to find the, uh, the, the, things to line up on, yeah, yeah. To, to, to put one feature on another yeah, feature, and if they lined up, you should be in the right yeah, position. Whereas on a pits, they, they are rock solid. You can, for instance, in a pits, for the uh, fore aft, I put your head on the uh, inter, uh, the, 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 the strut, the triangular part of the strut. Also look at the top and the bottom. And then for four aft, you can uh, you take the you take the landing wires and the flying wires and the uh, what is the, the, and javelin. the javelin, yeah, and you line that up and it's uh, that's you how you keep that position the, and you yeah. line that up with the interplane strut, right. and and that's how you keep position. Now, in your in your time as a formation aerobatic pilot, you have flown with a number of. Uh, of different wingmen. For one reason or another, they some of them haven't stayed for longer than six, eight years or so because of personal circumstances and, uh, and career changes, etc. Uh, but what would you say one of the most uh, important attributes is for membership to an aerobatic team? Well, the most important is that the person can, in fact, do the job. Firstly, that is obviously the most important. But when you're working in a small unit, you want to get on with the person. Yeah, you want to like the person. You need to trust the person. And trust is paramount. Skill and trust. You don't want a guy on your wing that you're worrying about whether he's going to take you out. He's going to do something crazy. He's not level-headed. He's not... Uh, uh, 
yeah, you just want to know that if he needs to break, he will break. Uh, and the same goes for your leader. You need to, to have trust in your leader, knowing that he's not going to fly in, into the ground. You don't, you don't have the, the luxury of looking after yourself on the wing. You have to look at the leader and you have to trust that the leader is going to look after you. Uh, if you start looking inside the cockpit, looking at altitudes, looking at speeds, your eye's not on the ball. And it, it's literally a blink of the eye looking away and, right. and you could hit the leader. Or you could be out of position. Yeah, or out of position. You know, it's one thing being out of position away from the leader, but you could yeah. find yourself out of position. Now, I see that you specialize, you know, as, as I... As I uh, grow somewhat older, I hate to think of myself as an old guy, but as, uh, as I uh, have become less and less involved, I see that you have blossomed in a spe the speciality of inverted formation flying. Uh, you can roll upside down in formation next to me, and I... I barely notice the difference in the manner in which you are maintaining station, whether you are upright or upside down. Is it a completely different skill set? Yeah, it, it is. It's a very different skill set. Uh, and uh, the thing with formation aerobatics is that it is such a, a vast subject. You know, you think if you, uh, if you can fly on the left, you can fly on the right, you can lead, you can fly in the box. But it's not so, you know, uh, you, you get to a point where you get trained on one side and you're very good at it. And then somebody moves you on an occasion to the other side and all of a sudden you feel like you're writing with your left hand, if you're right-handed, so to speak. Or you get put in the lead and you feel overwhelmed with the, the responsibility. So I've just found that... Uh, because of my upbringing information flying, which you gave me and which Chris Roderman, Jeff Birch, Johan Driss gave me, uh, I found myself moving around. And it was important to become very comfortable in all those positions. And then once I become comfortable in those positions, you think, well, now I want to become comfortable inverted too. And you just want to explore the discipline more and more. And even after all these years, I still feel that there's a lot more to explore. I mean, we've, we've always operated in a small unit of four. Uh, you know, you look at those military teams where they're flying nine, and we've never done that. And I think that's also something I don't think we'll ever get to do it. But it just shows you how vast the, 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 the subject is or the, the, the discipline is. You know, uh, I, uh, we've, we've spent our lives up here at five and a half thousand feet above, uh, above sea level. And, uh, and also on the hot and high days, we have density altitudes of eight, eight and a half thousand feet. We're running out of power operating up here in Gauteng and in the free state. Uh, do you feel that as a result we have not realized our full potential that we could have done better if we were based at sea level yeah i definitely think we could have done a lot better if we were based at sea level unfortunately you know uh, virginia was always the, the place to perform I've, i think i said that in, in an article that i wrote it would have been nice to spend more time you know nelspruit peter meritsburg durban those were times where we really got to cook, so to speak. But the time there that we spent there was so limited that we never got to practice at that altitude. And even if we did, we were always coming back up here. So we couldn't do what we could do there, here. So, yeah, we have been dealt a little bit, being uh, uh, sitting up at 5,500 foot, and that's on a good day. On a bad day, that 5,500 foot can equate up to seven and a half, eight thousand foot in density altitude. I mean, the Americans and a lot of the Europeans just look at us as if we we're crazy flying uh, aerobatics at, at, at those density altitudes. I, I felt that every time I came back from the coast, it was uh, yeah. just the most terrible, terrible letdown to be sitting flying in this thin air. And uh, I, I think I'll go to my grave regretting the fact that I never 
flew my entire career at sea level. It would have been fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because of the, uh, the, the, the power that you've got over there. Now, the other thing is that you and Arnie are doing a lot of work upside down. And uh, I, I don't know whether I went out on a limb when I said that I believe that the two of you are the first guys to ever perform an invert, a double, a double or a formation, should I say, inverted ribbon cut. Tell us about how you did that. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually not as big a deal as it sounds. I mean, guys have been doing inverted ribbon cuts for, I mean, barnstormers were doing it uh, how many years ago? Maybe a century ago. You know, Arnie and I were doing a lot of uh, inverted uh, practicing with him in the box and uh, and some low push outs and we're pushing out pushing out and then eventually we got to the I was comfortable to cut the ribbon and then we just decided just make the poles a tad taller and put a second ribbon on that and then uh, and and do a, a, a double inverted ribbon cut and uh, um, so it is I suppose I do have to fly a little bit lower maybe slightly lower not much uh, and Arnie's got to tuck it in pretty tight. Yeah, otherwise, apart from that, it, it's, it's just a stock standard ribbon cut with, with somebody above you. And no sooner had you done this than uh, air shows were closed down with COVID. Yeah. So you haven't had a chance to actually uh, display this except for one opportunity, which was at Nelsprate. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. And at air shows, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, you know, when Arnie and I first did it, we did it at Clip River. We do all our practicing there. It's flat as a pancake. We know the area, so it's a lot easier to do it there and have it filmed by somebody than actually at an air show. And Elspray presented, you know, it's funny, but when you get to an airfield that's different, there's a slight upslope, lots of people watching, the whole, the visibility is different. We didn't get it right on the, on the first attempt. I think we got it right second or third. Uh, just getting the feel of it. But the setup also takes a long yeah. time. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the, the setup on the airfield itself. While yeah. you're sitting up there, you've, you've got people that have got to move into position with poles and with ribbons and with radios, and you've got to have a, a, a skilled team yeah. um, erect the actual uh, poles and the ribbons for you. Is that right? Yeah. 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 I think the, 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 the challenge, not even the challenge, the, the difference between the double inverted ribbon cut and a normal ribbon cut is the fact that the, as a leader you don't have a quick out uh, you know if you by yourself and you get too low to the ground and you want to push away you just push away it's a quick at that speed it, it's just a quick push and you're out the way but you have to be mindful that now you've got somebody behind you so you've got to keep it as steady and be as sure of yourself a lot more sure of yourself than you would be if you were by yourself with a little bit of luck we're going to be up and running again soon and back to normal strength yeah and we're going to be on the air show circuit uh making up for lost time with our harvards with our pit specials have you got any special uh acts lined up are you thinking of doing anything in the future reviving anything anything new in the future should i say anything yeah there, there are a couple of ideas on the boil we've spoken about them but something to look forward to just for now is the two plus two which is going to be the two harvards and the two extras arnie and i you and sean i think that's a lovely mix yeah. of airplanes it's two new. fire breathing Harvard's making a noise of, of attitude and grunt and filling yeah. the sky with a lot of smoke and then in between the the dashing uh, extras. I think that's going to be a super team, yeah. super, yeah, super display that we're going to, to put on. To, to look forward to. Yes. Yeah, I mean, now we're in the position where we can mix and match. You know, we did three pizzas and two extras, one Harvard, two extras, now two two extras and, and, and two Harvard's. Change is as good as a holiday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, dreaming up stunts. I just wanted to say, you know, uh, I grew up around uh, Chris Rodeman, Jeff Birch, 
Chris always was dreaming up maneuvers and analyzing and like just always trying to be at the cold face. He was always pushing and exploring. And as a kid, I used to sit there and yeah, listen to him. And I can only agree with you. And I made mention of that fact in my book. And, and I said how uh, uh, he, he had such a dynamic initiative that uh, you'd come back from something and he'd say, hey, why don't we try this? Why don't we do it this way? Why don't we try that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and, and, and not only did he come up with these ideas, but um, uh, he was a great analyst. If you were having a problem with the maneuver, he was the guy that would give you an aerodynamic solution to the problem. Yeah, no, I, and I remember that clearly. I, I, I hero worshipped him. I hero worshipped Jeff and Johan. I used to sit and listen to Chris, and uh, and Jeff would just quietly also take it all in and just get get the job done. You, Jeff, Johan, Chris pioneered uh, civilian formation aerobatics in this country, and little things that we've learnt, people take for granted, like. I remember Jeff saying to me later on, ending a maneuver and turning behind the crowd and then moving out of position and relaxing. And Jeff saying, somebody is always watching you. He said, stay in formation from the time you start to the time you end. doesn't matter whether you're behind the crowd or in front of the crowd. He said, there's somebody somewhere watching you and you don't want to be the one that they say, oh, why is that guy? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, why, why is he? Why is he back or out? Yes. Or, yeah. And now we've got uh, a young lady in our team as well. Your sister, my daughter, and uh, it, it, it's it's quite incredible to see the finesse with which she flies. I'm amazed to see how beautifully uh, that young lassie flies. Yeah. No. She she flies. Like you say, with probably more finesse, I, I don't like ever to admit that somebody flies smoother than me, but uh, I think she might. <laughs> I don't think there's anyone that flies smoother than you do, no, but, but, uh, but if, if, if she's close to you, then that's fine. Yeah, yeah, no, she, she flies very smoothly. With the little bit of instruction or the little bit of flying that I've done with her, I've always been very, very uh, impressed with how smoothly she flies. And, uh, and also, you know, flying with her on the wing. I never worry about her on the wing. Yeah, oh, I must say that uh, she's doing all of the advanced maneuvers as well now. And uh, I just can't wait to fly a performance with her in the team as well. Yeah, it's, it's been unfortunate for her that she's never been able to, to gain traction for firstly becoming a mother. She was starting to get traction again and then COVID hits. But hopefully once this is over, uh, yeah, she can really get going and start moving forward. There are a lot of things she doesn't know about that I've thought of that we're going to do with her. And she's, if she's willing and uh, she's going to have an exciting Super. Well, Ellis, it's been lovely talking to you like this. Uh, funnily enough, uh, we, we seldom get to have a chat like this. And yeah. here we are. Uh, knowing so much about each other but yet uh, there's always something else that you can learn and thank you so much for coming in and chatting to us and uh, and long may your fertile mind dream up uh, uh, some more uh, amazing stunts thanks Dave.